Class is in session. Welcome to episode one of Miss Education with Pretty Please, giving you the education you missed. In today's episode, we'll be discussing something everyone has been talking about: dormitories. 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 On Tuesday, 14 April, Minister of Manpower Josephine Teo announced that all migrant worker dormitories on the island would effectively be on lockdown. As of 22nd April 2020, 12 p.m., it is the third consecutive day of more than 1,000 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 among work permit holders residing in dorms. But before we talk about current day dorms, we first have to understand a little bit about the history of migrant labour in Singapore and trace back to where we started so as to understand how we got to today and most importantly, where we should go from here. History 101 Singapore was built on the backs of migrants. They did everything from constructing our roads and buildings to literally carrying out shit. Many of the first transient labourers in Singapore in the 1860s were men. And this gave rise to the demand for shared housing, coolie quarters or coolie lines, similar to what we call worker dormitories today. Also, it is important to note that many of these men didn't find these jobs on LinkedIn. They were shipped in as convict labour or indentured labour as part of working off their debt. They lived in purpose-built semi-temporary coolie quarters located within the estate of work. These men, and also working class women, lived packed like sardines in squalid conditions. This Straits Times piece on June 1911 describes some of these living conditions in the coolie quarters as overcrowded and badly lighted and ventilated, saturated with urine, that sick men occupy the same room as healthy men so that the disease has every chance of spreading and that the municipal health officers should give more attention. Hmm, sounds familiar. These men lived on nearly nothing, owned nearly nothing and were far away from their families, not unlike the migrant labour we still find in Singapore today. In the 1980s, in order to support its rapidly growing economy, Singapore hired migrant labourers mostly from South Asian countries such as India and Bangladesh to support its investment projects in construction, manufacturing and shipyard industries. As of June 2019, work permit holders accounted for 981,000 of Singapore's 5.7 million residents. That's almost one in five people in Singapore. To keep costs low, Brenda Yeo, a migration studies expert at NUS, notes that Singapore adopted a bifurcated labour policy with an unequal treatment of different categories of transnational workers. Construction workers, domestic workers and other neglected groups like sex workers received the brunt of this labour policy as they were and still are deemed unskilled and are not accorded basic labour protections such as standardised working hours, minimum wage and a right to unionise. I don't know lah, but if you ask me, having sex, building a whole country and taking care of your kids is a skill lah. But okay. Though these workers are crucial in building Singapore, they have never been integrated into the Singaporean community. In fact, they are subject to the use and discard policy of foreign employment and have regulations in place to ensure that they do not integrate into the Singaporean society through marriage or citizenship. Most migrant workers in Singapore are housed in purpose-built dormitories on the fringes of the island. We'll talk more about this later on, but for now, let's find out where migrant workers live today. Lai Ting Ting Tu. This one thing from MOM website, huh? don't say I plagiarize. There are six types of housing for migrant workers in Singapore. When people say dorms, they usually mean purpose-built dorms and factory converted dorms. Not your U-Town condo style dorms. Huh? Factory converted dorms are industrial or warehouse developments which have been partially converted to dormitories. Approximately 10,600 workers live in FCDs. Purpose-built dorms have services like mini mats, dedicated cooking areas, laundry areas, remittance and recreation recreational facilities. However, the only catch is that these amenities are oftentimes deductible from their salaries, sometimes without their full consent. Approximately 200,000 migrant workers live in PBDs. Sounds like an array of choice? We're not done yet. There is also another option, which is the illegal housing arrangement, which unfortunately is the choice of some employers in the bid to lower their costs. Illegal housing arrangements for migrant workers can come in the form of employers housing workers in overcrowded units or unapproved factory premises. In such cases, it is not uncommon for employers to enter false addresses so as to circumvent housing requirements. So now you know a little bit of history. You know what housing types are available, but now it's time to know who are the main actors of this story. There are five main actors. Dormitory operators, employers, MOM, NGOs, 
and the general public. First, dormitory operators. Given that dorms have had the reputation for overcrowding, there's no surprise that these dorms have had active transmission clusters of the COVID-19 virus. A list of purpose-built dorms can be found on MOM's website, but the full list of factory converted dorms is unavailable online. Dorm operations are actually profit-making businesses. They are not in this for charity. In fact, they make quite a bit of money. Centurion, for example, also does business in Malaysia and earned 52 million in 2019. But how do you make 52 million dollars collecting rent from people who make approximately 18 dollars a day? First of all, dorm operators have a huge customer base. There are approximately 1 million migrant workers in Singapore. And according to building code regulations, the living space per worker should minimally be 4.5 square meters. It is a common practice for them to pack as many people as possible within in this space. A measure to maximize profits while adhering to this building code restriction is by adding double-decker beds, which is the common arrangement for dormitories. This is 4.5 meters square. Here's Yao Ming for reference. Thanks, Yao! If there were no roofs, they would stack people all the way to the sun. And who do you think would be the ones building a bedding structure like that? <sighs> and false advertising. Now class, pay attention to this. Source-based question, what is wrong with this photo? With lush greenery and extensive landscape all around the dormitory, it is easy to see why Vobis Dormitory is often mistaken to be a hotel or resort. Vobis Dormitory is the only resort-style dormitory in Singapore. The truth is, dorms often present a highly manicured version of themselves. Hello, police? Yeah, now also building start catfishing. <laughs> Besides, this is what a resident claims. You know what they say, the customer is always right. Maybe we should have sent all the UK and US students there for their hashtag stay home notice. Or maybe this could have been the Lady Sentosa Cove party home. Oh wait, cannot. her husband owns another dorm, not this one. So, who are the people running them? There are a few prominent ownership groups amongst dormitory operators. First, MES Group, which is one of the largest dormitory owners in Singapore. They also own Labortel, a construction company. Remember that name, we'll come back to it later. They are the dormitory owners of the Leo Dorm. The Leo was actually the home for the first migrant worker who contracted the virus back on 8th of February. According to an old archive webpage, MES Group was actually headed by a former PAP Senior Minister of State for Education and environment and a grassroots leader. This was back in 2016. Their names were removed from the website after one of their companies, Labortel, was charged in court. It is unclear who runs MES Group now, but it's important to note that while we are trying to introduce each actor and their respective roles separately, we must remember that the relationships between different actors are sometimes interconnected and are by no means mutually exclusive. There is not enough transparent data on who owns and operates dormitories in Singapore. In fact, the dormitory operating industry considers of a web of many different players that unfortunately creates a diffusion of responsibility from the top down. For example, a single dorm operator might own multiple dormitories while also running construction companies who hire migrant workers. If MOM discovers a housing violation and the construction company aka the employer is responsible for providing housing for these workers, then would the dorm operator have culpability given that they are the owners of the employing company? Are you confused? Because I am. It is difficult to hold 1% account when there are so many layers in between sub-actors and the relationships between these layers are ambiguous. This complicates enforcement even if we do not take the strength of regulations into account. Next, employers. Employers have previously been charged pre-pandemic under the Foreign Employee Dormitories Act, put out by the MOM which took effect in January 2016. Remember Labortel, owned by the MES Group? They were the first company to be charged under this act for 10 offences between November 2017 and January 2019 for poor maintenance including damaged light fixtures, faulty shower taps and corroded railings and staircases. The Ministry of Manpower which carried out the checks said the living conditions were so filthy and unacceptable that cockroaches were found in the rooms. Kalim Construction is another company that has been charged and additionally banned from hiring foreign workers. They were fined $156,000 for housing 60 foreign workers in dirty rat-infested temporary living quarters near their work site. In the conversation of migrant workers' rights, a lot of the spotlight has been on employers for a myriad of issues. 
not just in not ensuring proper housing for their employees, but also unpaid wages and unsafe work conditions. While it is true that there are many errant employers, we must also remember that employers are ultimately subjected to the larger legislations, regulations or the lack thereof. Certain governmental regulations are insufficient in protecting workers, leaving room for employers to exploit their staff, while at the same time also restricting good intention employers from making better living arrangements for them. For example, because of restrictions set by URA, workers' dormitories are subjected to specific buffers and quotas and are not allowed to be erected within certain areas in Singapore. And in some cases, if an employer wanted a house workers in temporary quarters or sites that may be of better condition than dorms, they are not able to. Next, Ministry of Manpower. What is the role of the MOM? First of all, they are the ones that grant licenses to most dorm operators in Singapore, which means these dorms are subject to their regulation. This means a lot of responsibility. Being a government body, it also means they have the power to enforce laws or not. While regulations exist within the Dorm Act, they are worded as advisories and non-compliance may not lead to criminal proceedings. MOM has the power to fine or reward dorms for certain standards. MOM can fine dorm operators for overcrowding and MOM can reward them through the Dormitory Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dormitory Awards, where we find out who can provide the least for the most, who can do just enough to be recognized at these awards. awards. This is exactly like Mediacorp and the Star Awards, but I guess self-praise is better than no praise. <laughs> Though many others have long been raising the issue about dorm overcrowding, the only body that has the capacity to address this directly and efficiently is MOM. It has the power to relook current standards and enact change on a policy level. But it also means that inaction or lack of enforcement leaves room for exploitation of the migrant worker. While we do see reports of MOM clamping down on some of the worst actors, some NGOs would argue that there is still a lot of work to do in this space. It seems like MOM has been addressing this issue from a per square feet point of view. Thanks, Yao! where decisions come down to statistics and zoning regulations. However, we need to consider human flourishing, the emotional, psychological and the more intangible needs of the migrant community. It's time to introduce our fourth actor, NGOs. In the context of the foreign worker space, there are several organisations like HealthServe, TWC2, HOME, It's Raining Raincoats and MWC who have been doing important work. They have been serving as a bridge between the workers and the government, advocating for workers' rights and directing their resources towards issues like salary disputes, living conditions and emotional well-being. Before we move further, it is important to clarify that technically non-governmental organisations and non-profit organisations have different meanings. However, in Singapore, NGO is frequently used as an umbrella term because the two are not usually differentiated from one another. If we are working on the definition of NGO being independent of the government, there might be a discrepancy on a definition level for Migrant Workers Centre to identify as an NGO. Some would go as far as calling them a gongo. MWC positions itself as a non-governmental organisation, despite it being a bipartisan effort between NTUC and SNEF. And MWC's current co-chairman is an ex-parliamentarian. At this point, let's remember that a very important function of NGOs is also to provide a check and balance to state power. Given that MWC has close affiliations to the government, is it still accurate to recognise them as an NGO? Can it still function as a check and balance? When the leader of an NGO states that their interest is in the growth of the economy instead of the rights of the people they aim to serve, you know something's not right. The focus to maximise profit above all else has got us here in the first place. Also, in Singapore, only some NGOs get IPC or charity status, which allows for tax relief for donations. Without tax relief, big donors like corporations will usually not donate. One of the main criteria to be IPC granted is that the organisation needs to serve the local community. But since migrant workers are not included in the definition of local community, it makes it difficult for groups like TWC2 who work exclusively with migrant workers to get IPC status. NGOs are supposed to be the crucial missing link, especially when providing for the most vulnerable groups in our society. However, as you can see, some organisations are systemically limited in terms of their reach and ability to affect change at scale. In this crisis, MOM has set up an interagency task force to coordinate efforts on the ground, such as ensuring that they get timely supply of catered meals and the premises are kept clean. 
but TWC2 and HOME are mysteriously missing members of this task force. Given that an organisation that is not listed as an essential service cannot operate at this time, it is almost impossible for some NGOs to do their work on the ground. While it is crucial to support all groups on the front lines of the pandemic right now, it is important that a diversity of approaches are embraced. Finally, the general public. Advocacy work from the people does make a difference. For example, the recent improvement of the food quality in the dorms. Many of the actors are motivated to respond based on the pressure, or lack thereof, by the public. However, xenophobia and racism persist. This is not breaking news. This is broken news. Remember when 1,400 people signed a petition against a dorm being built in Serangoon Gardens? These characterizations are further fueled by leaders and newspaper channels. Okay, enough! Lian He Zhao Bao, get out of my classroom! <laughs> These feelings should never be legitimized or used as justification for discrimination. When the media gives these ideas a platform, it gives an excuse for inaction. We must hold media sources accountable for how they frame a narrative, especially when there is limited freedom of press. We need to clamp down on this the same way we would racism among citizens. Wow, can go recess already! Hello, we haven't even talked about what's going on in the dorms yet. Now let's talk about the conditions in dorms. The current state of legislation and governmental regulation has led to poor living conditions at dormitories. They have been subpar for a long time, and this has been pointed out by NGOs, academics, and other stakeholders during this time. Now, in a time of a global pandemic, the effects of COVID-19 are being exacerbated by the bad living standards that have been normalized for too long. This norm has to be improved, sustained, and monitored long after the pandemic passes. This system needs to function like my thighs, cannot have any gap. There has been a failure over time. These have been some of the issues that have been brought up over time. Recently, on the 7th of April, a Today Online report seemed to suggest that MOM was placing the responsibility of cleanliness on the migrant workers by calling on the dormitory residents to play their role against the spread of the virus. However, without adequate living facilities, it would be nearly impossible to keep such solid living quarters clean. Echoing this, TWC2 states in the article, In Defense of Squalor, this boils down to inadequate living space. Thanks, Yao! Just like how your mom checks in on you, this mom needs to do enough checks to make sure dorm operators are maintaining a standard of care. It is not the worker's responsibility to clean or maintain common dorms as residents are paying dorms for these services. Right now, the responsibility is on the worker to bring up issues in the dormitory with their employers. For example, through MOM's Dorm Watch app, workers and dorm operators can resolve the problems through the app and MOM only steps in if it cannot be resolved after a certain period of time. This isn't fair because the power imbalance is too great. Workers are resistant to speaking up about issues because it could jeopardize their job. This is why MOM needs to tighten and enforce legislation to protect the workers. Installing Wi-Fi or adding lockers is not enough. Besides, workers can't choose their dorms, so we need to ensure standards are up to par across all dorm types for everyone. Relating back to the COVID-19 pandemic, this is not the first time viral diseases have spread in dorms. In 2008, there was a chickenpox outbreak in a dormitory, where one worker died and 10 were sent to the hospital. When interviewed, the dorm owner declared, I have 700 to 800 workers in a dormitory. It is not unusual if someone dies a natural death. And more recently, the dormitories that are currently active transmission clusters of the coronavirus are the same dormitories that suffered a measles outbreak in 2019. TWC too has brought up these issues in the past, but the core issues of density in the dorms still have not been addressed. Besides, as part of the Foreign Employee Dormitories Bill, quarantine measures were already supposed to be in place. Ha, huh, teacher, then how? Ah, nalla pulle. I'm glad you brought that up. Maybe if we follow the money, it'll offer more clarity. A lot of public opinion is that solving the issue of dorm conditions and standards of living must come out of tax dollars. But is this the only resource pool available? The answer of who needs to fix this problem is simple. Whoever is directly profiting should be directly responding. Purpose-built dorms are for profit. Returning to the example from earlier, there are also overlaps between dorm operators and employers. Some dorms are owned by employers. Imagine if Centurion took some of its 52 
$2 million in profits and put its workers in accommodation where social distancing could be practiced. The government also receives a foreign worker levy from employers. This ranges from $300 to $950 per worker per month. Can the government redirect some of the billions collected in foreign worker levies towards migrant care? We need more transparency as to what is going on. For the amount of value they bring to those who profit, this discrepancy seems really problematic. Josephine Theo, my small spaces queen, says that to improve these standards, which they are looking to do post-pandemic, we should be willing to accept the higher cost that comes with higher standards. Yes, perhaps we, as residents, may see some small increases in things like maintenance work costs. However, most of the higher costs should be absorbed and corrected by the levy and the profits that the companies have made from migrant labour. Now let's bring this all together. What's going on right now? The first known case of coronavirus amongst the migrant worker population was Case 42, discovered on the 8th of February. This should have been a warning to make sure all dorms, regardless of type, had strict measures in place. Instead, the MOM assured employers not to turn away workers and issued quarantine orders for other workers who came into close contact with him. The next time we heard of migrant workers in relation to the coronavirus on mainstream media was on the 31st of March, when three new transmission clusters were discovered. A government advisory to dorm operators only came on the 5th of April and was largely ambiguous about roles and responsibilities. For more information on this, you can visit this link to check out our previous video. The time between the first case and the dorm clusters forming was approximately two months. Why did it take this long to identify that dorms would be a site for a rapid virus outbreak? If we had paid attention, would it have been smoother to operationalize and direct help? And could we have a smaller number of infections among the migrant worker community? Why was alternative accommodation to reduce the density of dorms not implemented when the rest of Singapore started social distancing? Social distancing can be practiced when there is space for people to stay apart in their everyday movements. That space is a privilege that migrant workers have been systematically denied. We must acknowledge this and understand that migrant workers are victims of the status quo. And we cannot be deflecting responsibility by blaming migrant workers for their current predicament. We have been seeing alternative living arrangements frantically being implemented in the past two weeks, such as shifting workers to car parks and SAF camps. Workers in essential services are also being shifted to on-block HDBs that have been vacant since 2018, and we wonder why this couldn't be done earlier. We have also read news articles about floating dorms, while MBS reminded us all to stay hashtag SG United. This is home! True! Oh! Oh! I guess I'm not the only tone deaf one, yeah? <laughs> Yet amidst all these arrangements, which are great, though late, it is also crucial to note that only a minority, workers who are performing essential services, of the community have been shifted out of their dormitories. Many of them, till this very point, are still stuck in their densely packed dormitories with no space to practice social distance. While MOM continues to share press releases about how alternative arrangements are being carried out and more inspections have been conducted to ensure good standards and practices within the dormitories, we also need to realise and pay attention to the fact that this is still the reality of most of the community. Last week, Minister for National Development Lawrence Wong said, Unfortunately, unfortunately we, we do not, not have, have the luxury of the benefit of, benefit of hindsight. hindsight. But to quote journalist Kristen Han in the Washington Post, you cannot have foresight for things you refuse to see. To conclude, it has become painfully clear that we have failed to protect our migrant workers. When the very systemic and physical structure of dormitories are built to alienate an entire community, we have effectively created two separate realities in Singapore. One for us, and one for them. So when a minister says we are dealing with two separate infections, while he is referring to two completely different methodologies in tackling the same virus, it also reveals a language of othering that has become so normalised in our Singapore story when talking and thinking about migrant workers. So where do we go from here? To be clear, this is a human rights and public health issue that we all have to respond to moving forward. We must directly respond to three things brought up in this video. Number one, the diffusion of responsibility through many levels of bureaucratic hierarchy. Number two, the lack of transparency. Number three, inadequate legislation and regulation. Here is your homework. I have some work for each and every one of you. During this pandemic, you, as part of Singaporean society, should volunteer, donate, and fill in the gaps to meet immediate and pressing needs. Get creative about how you can help, like this. 
For MOM and all other relevant ministries, quickly implement measures to reduce density across all dorms in Singapore. Your required readings are TWC2's recommendations of not more than four persons per dorm room and Holmes' comments on the Foreign Employees Dormitory Act. Ensure that cleaning and food service at dorms during the COVID-19 pandemic should not be deducted from the workers' current or future pay. Work with caterers to ensure that all workers in dormitories during this government lockdown period are provided with nutritious food. Redistribute 70% of the $100 of the government relief given to employers to be given directly to workers. Extend paid leave days across the board for all workers who are affected right now, as suggested by home. Ensure that there is a channel of clear and direct communication in multiple languages within the dormitories so that workers are not receiving information through online sources and word of mouth. Communication skills is a very big chapter in your syllabus. Huh? Better make sure you all study and don't spot question for exam only. Workers who violate circuit breaker measures should not have their work permits revoked and deported back without a proper appeal process. For employers, some employers have made a 25% wage cut during this pandemic as a pandemic-specific cost-cutting measure. MOM, employers, group project. We need to ensure that this will not be a permanent salary deduction post-pandemic. Some employers have let workers go. This means the workers potentially lose their accommodation too. These workers have loans back at home and lives matter on their month-to-month -month paychecks. Please keep your workers through this difficult time. It is only the right thing to do. MOM, again ah, you are the prefect. Make sure this doesn't happen anymore. Some employers have not paid their workers for past month's work. We urge all employers to be accountable for their actions and pay what's due. Post-pandemic homework for everybody. Listen up ah. Demand transparency, accountability by all actors and government legislation to match more equitable standards of care. Minister of Manpower Josephine Teo gave us her word, but no concrete commitments as of yet. But maybe the most important word of all is from the migrant workers themselves. In a recent report by CARE, here are some of their recommendations. There are suggestions here to mitigate the following. Overcrowding, a lack of privacy, cleanliness, Sanitation, health infrastructure, food, and well being. These are basic standards of care that must be met. In Singapore, we have denied migrant workers of this for far too long. These last few weeks have painfully revealed the dire consequences of this denial. We have said it before and we will say it again. We are paying for peacetime inadequacies during a time of a pandemic. We cannot uphold the fantasy of two separate communities living in isolated realities. We are both inextricably linked. Post-pandemic, we cannot go back to business as usual. We need to progress through active conversation and action so that as a society, we can push for change that we want to see. Let's not forget, many of the transient day wage laborers of the 20th century and their descendants are now citizens or permanent residents in Singapore. The migrant reality is our reality. Okay, everybody, class dismissed. <laughs> Go.